Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's coffee, coffee seminar. We have Jennifer De Luca from uh, Colorado State University. She's a professor at the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Department there. She got her PhD in Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology from the University of California at Santa Barbara. And then she flew to the East for a postdoctoral position at uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, among, the, um, among her organizations, she uh, was named a Pew Scholar in the Biomedical Sciences in 2009. So thank you for coming. Okay. Right. Is it? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. So thanks for the invitation to come and talk and to interact with the students in the COSI program. And for the chance to tell you a little bit about what um, my lab's been doing since we've gotten set up in, in uh, the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at CSU. So again, I was just chatting with the graduate students about hitting a balance between biology and, and non-biology. So I'm going to do my best <laughs> to... Uh, to give kind of a broad talk, but I really want to get into some of the specific questions that we want to ask and how these assays, these light microscopy assays, can help us answer them. But please, please, if at any point anything doesn't make sense or you just need a clarification on a term, please interrupt and maybe it can be more of an open discussion. That would be fantastic. So, okay. So, <coughs> um, the focus of the research in our lab is in understanding the fundamental process of mitotic um, cell division, basically how, how cells divide. And in particular, we use a combination of biochemical approaches and cell biological approaches to understand how these chromosomes, the mitotic cells, are able to attach to these mitotic spindle fibers, which I'll explain later, shown in white. How these attachments are able to generate forces for chromosome movement, so they can go from a, a configuration like this to like this. And then finally, how this regulation, how these, these attachments are very finely regulated, so that when the cell does divide, the chromosomes are exactly divided equally into two daughter cells. And so what I'll talk about today is a, a group of proteins that our lab has been studying that's involved in all of these processes. And along the way, I'll tell you how we use light microscopy as a tool. And then at the end, and also throughout the talk, I'll explain how, um, um, what some of the limitations and disadvantages of using these techniques are. Okay, so just again, as I mentioned, Cell division is a fundamental um, biological process, and obviously we need cell division to go from one cell to a highly functioning uh, multicellular organism like this. And even once, even past development, once an organism is fully developed, you still need, require a constant level of cell division. Um, and in fact, each day in an adult, say, male body, uh, millions and millions of cells are dying, and they need to be continually replaced with new cells by cell division. And in fact, if all cell division were to stop all at once, we as humans could only last for about 48 hours without new cell division. So it's important. We need it. And in terms of disease um, and human health, the fidelity of chromosome segregation during mitosis is also very important. And again, just in this very uh, simple schematic, what I'm trying to show you here is that when errors in this process occur, shown here, where we have chromosomes that are not quite lined up correctly here at the metaphase plate, and again, I'll explain all this terminology later, but if this cell were allowed to go into anaphase, what you'd end up with would be cells that have either too many or too few chromosomes. And this is a condition known as aneuploidy. And the reason that we care about aneuploidy is because this condition has been strongly linked to both the initiation and the progression of human tumors. And almost 100% of all human cancers um, are aneuploid. So the idea is that if you, if you screw up in chromosome segregation, you get aneuploid cells, and these aneuploid cells can, can then initiate cancer progression. Or the cancer process. So cells have to figure out mechanisms to prevent that from happening. All right, so just to kind of get everybody on the same page and going back to the basics, and this may remind you of um, eighth grade biology, but basically in order to uh, divide the cell, the cell must first enter into the cell cycle. And the cell cycle is shown here as this kind of continuous loop where a cell undergoes a phase of growth, the chromosomes are duplicated, and then it undergoes another phase of growth, and then in mitosis, the chromosomes are split and hopefully split equally into two daughter cells. And the phases of mitosis are shown down here. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to introduce this terminology because I might be using it later in the talk. So right before mitosis um, begins, the chromosomes are bounded by the membrane of the nuclear envelope. As you can see, they're kind of all clustered in here together. 
At the onset of mitosis, this envelope breaks down. The chromosomes spill into the cytoplasm. The chromosomes then, um, very hard, they try to uh, attach to these fibers of the mitotic spindle. Once they attach to these fibers, they can be driven to the metaphase plate. And once they reach this alignment at the metaphase plate, a signal can be given so the two sister, um, so, the, so the chromosomes that have been duplicated can split apart to opposite sides of the cell. And most of these um, events, at least the chromosome movements, can be seen just looking under transmitted light. And so what we have here is a PTK1 cell. And I explained this a little bit um, earlier in the pre-talk, but basically what PTK1 cells are, they're um, derived from uh, kidney epithelium from these uh, marsupials called rat kangaroos. And so, let me just play it again. And so one reason that we like to use these cells, even though they're not human cells, is because they remain very flat during mitosis. And you can actually visualize quite a bit of the chromosome movements as they line up at the metaphase plate, and then once all the chromosomes are aligned, the chromosomes can split apart to opposite sides of the cell. What is this time so the time, so this is a 45 minute movie. Um, yep, I can't remember the frame, right, but the whole thing's 45 minutes. Yep. Okay, so this is gonna be kind of the busiest slide with terminology, but I thought I would just get it out there and then we can move on. So in order for these chromosomes to get where they're going, and in order for them to have the forces generated for them to, to, to gain this alignment on the metaphase plate, they must become attached to the spindle fibers, and these are called microtubules. So microtubules are polymers of the tubule and subunit. Okay? So these microtubules, they organize themselves during mitosis in this very specific arrangement, which is called a bipolar spindle. And the reason it's called bipolar is because it has a pole here, and it has a pole here, and these poles organize these microtubules emanating out from them. And that's shown in cartoon form here. We have a pole here, a pole here, and the microtubules kind of array out from these poles. So what's interesting about these polymers of microtubules is they're not simply static polymers that grow out to some length and then maintain that length at steady state. But instead, they undergo what's called dynamic instability. So these polymers, what they do at any given moment, if you were looking at the end of one of these microtubules, you would see that it's either growing very fast or shortening very fast. So rather than just sitting out here stagnantly, what you'd see is this microtubule shrinking back and growing, shrinking back and growing, shrinking back and growing, and just undergoing continuous cycles of this, of, 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 of the, of this polymerization and depolymerization. Again, and this property is called dynamic instability. So again, it, both in vitro and in vivo, these microtubules are extremely dynamic, polymerizing and depolymerizing and switching back between these two phases. So again, in order for chromosomes to get aligned here at the metaphase plate, they must become attached to these microtubules. So what's interesting is these, these microtubules then that attach to the chromosomes, first of all, one more piece of um, kind of terminology, the point at which the microtubules attach is called the kinetochore, shown as this little yellow dot. And it's actually a large protein structure built here at the primary constriction of these chromosomes. But these microtubules will capture a chromosome by binding to this kinetochore. And as I mentioned, these microtubules are constantly growing and shortening and growing and shortening and growing and shortening. So what happens once this microtubule binds this kinetochore and becomes embedded in it, it continues to be dynamic. And in fact, it's the dynamic behavior and the polymerization and depolymerization of this, of this polymer that's gonna provide the force for chromosome movement. So if, you, if, you if I'm the chromosome and I have the kinetochores here and a microtubule is embedded into the kinetochore, if that microtubule depolymerizes, it's gonna whip the chromosome that way. And if that microtubule polymerizes, it's gonna push the chromosome that way. So it's very important that these microtubules maintain these dynamics in order to push and pull the chromosomes around the mitotic cell. And that's the forces generated for these movements through these attachments between the microtubules and the kinetochores. Okay. And so what, what are the sizes? Okay, so let's see, he, I should have put a scale bar here. So the spindle pole from that kind of centroid to that centroid, that would measure about 12 microns. And, the, um, and in terms of the kinetochores, if you were to measure the, the centroid to centroid of the sister kinetochores, um, in a relaxed state, it would be about a micron, and in a stretched state, which I'll talk about later, it's about two and a half microns. Okay. So a HeLa cell is actually quite a bit smaller than the PTK1 cell that, we showed, that I showed you before, and I'll talk about that a little later. And one more thing I wanna mention on the slide is that for this process to work, and for chromosomes to correctly segregate, these chromosomes, are, are, they're comprised of duplicated sister chromatids, right? So one copy needs to go to this cell when the cell divides, and one copy needs to go to this side. 
So in order for this to happen, microtubules from this pole have to attach to this kinetochore, and microtubules from this pole have to attach to this kinetochore. So when the signal to split is given, the chromatids split apart, and they're each pulled to the opposite sides of the cell. Okay, so the kinetochore has this kind of very interesting job of both making and maintaining attachments to microtubules. So as a bio biochemically, you can imagine it's a very interesting type of attachment because the proteins that make the attachment have to bind very tightly to the microtubules in order to generate the forces for, the, for moving those big chromosomes around the cell. But at the same time, those attachments must be somewhat dynamic or flexible because they're constantly following a polymerizing and depolymerizing microtubule end. Right, so how do you set up a protein system that can bind very tightly to generate force, but yet at the same time be very dynamic and flexible so that it can follow a growing and shortening microtubule end? And this has been probably the major question in our field for many, 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 many years. And it's still unresolved. Yes, sorry. So what we have here, um, we have a, a chromosome is shown in blue, stained with DAPI, and the kinetochores are shown in red. And this is, I'm not sure which kinetochore marker this is, probably an inner protein. And then here we have a mitotic cell where the microtubules are shown in red. And again, the kinetochores are shown in green. What's missing from here are the chromosomes. Okay, so these dynamic movements that the kinetochore has to, has to keep up with hopefully can be shown here. And so what you'll see in this movie, which runs about 20 minutes, and again, I'll let it loop through a couple times, but what we have in the cell, we have the kinetochore stained for in red and the microtubules stained for in green. And hopefully you can see that as the, as the microtubules are growing and shortening and growing and shortening, they're holding on to that red kinetochore, pushing it in and out um, along the metaphase plate. So one more time. So if you focus in on one of these microtubules, you can see that it's growing and shortening and growing and shortening all the time holding on to that kinetochore. So again, what are the proteins that make that interaction and how does it work? Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the molecular biology of the kinetochore, but I just wanna throw this up here to show you that it's a very busy place. So what we have here is a cartoon uh, version of a chromosome. Here's the primary constriction where the kinetochore is built. The kinetochore, is consi con the kinetochore consists of kind of arbitrarily an inner domain and an outer domain of proteins. And then here we have the microtubule that's gonna come and bind. So like I said, the kinetochore is a very busy place. There are now upwards of 100 proteins that have been localized there. Some we know what they do, some we don't. But the bottom line is, um, um, this is just a sampling of them and we're not gonna talk about any of these actually. And so what I the point that I wanna make from this slide is, out of all these proteins that are known to be at the kinetochore, and all the proteins that we still don't know that may localize to the kinetochore. Again, what are the proteins that physically make the contacts that reach out and grab that microtubule and then allow that microtubule to grow and shorten? So that's our basic question. What are the proteins that do that and how do they do it? Okay, so when we first started embarking on this project, um, the two questions or the two criteria that we, that we kind of developed were pretty straightforward. So first of all, we wanted to find proteins that localized to the kinetochore. Basically, it was at the right place at the right time. And secondly, proteins whose depletion from cells resulted in defects in chromosome congression and microtubule attachment to kinetochores. And so I'll skip ahead a couple of years and say our prime candidate ended up being this protein complex. And this will be the only protein complex that I talk about, um, about today. So basically, this complex is made up of four proteins. They're called HEC1, NUF2, SPC24 and SPC25. These two proteins, 24 and 25, form a dimer. These two proteins form a dimer, and then they come together to form a heterotetramer. And this heterotetramer, that's the extent of animation that I can do with my PowerPoint slides. Um, <coughs> and so these, these, these proteins come together to form, this, to form this elongated rod. And so in vitro studies have shown, both by AFM and by rotary shadowing EM, that this complex is, is quite elongated and it's about 55 nanometers in length. How do, you generate this? How do we generate this image up here? I can, yep. What is the meaning? What is the meaning of it? Okay, I can tell you. What, of the coils? Yeah, this one blue there. Yeah, I'll tell you all about that, yeah. <laughs> so basically, uh, Raphael asked, what, what, what kind of structure is this and why is this here? So when you see these kind of coils and coil domains, it's an indication of a crystal structure has been solved. 
And it's not actually quite so simple with this complex of getting the crystal structure because, so it's this big elongated rod, right? And people who do X-ray crystallography, I'm not one of those people, but people who do it know that you can't have big, long, flexible rods and get crystals. You have to have kind of tightly packed domains to get crystals. So um, we, with, with, with another, we worked with another group um, on this paper. What, basically, what, what, what the crystallographers did was very cool, I thought. They lopped out all of this coiled coil domain, and they fused this piece to this piece, and this piece to this piece. So they just shortened the whole complex. And so it cut out all this coil coil. And by doing that, they were able to generate crystals and get a crystal structure. So they know the crystal structure of this and this, and this is all um, fantasy. I mean, it's, it's predicted to be coiled coil, and so they draw it as a coiled coil, but that's, th there is no structural data for this part. There's structural data for this and this. So. And the idea was that you could lop out the middle, uh, kind of assuming the, en the, the two ends were doing the business, or the important things. Okay, so again, the, you know, the first criteria was that it localizes to kinetochores, and so again, we can use immunofluorescence and use antibodies specific to our proteins of interest, and we can show um, in various different cell types that the proteins of the NDC80 complex do in fact localize to kinetochores. So here in blue, we have the chromosomes. They're stained with a DAPI stain. We have the red. These are microtubules stained with an antitubulin antibody. And then in green, we have uh, the kinetochores, and these are marked with an anti-HEC1 antibody. So clearly showing this paired dot formation at kinetochores throughout all stages of mitosis. And again, we can replicate this in many, many different cell types. And at this point, I'll bring up another cell type that we use in the lab quite often, which are HeLa cells, which many of you might have heard of. They're human uh, cervical cancer cells that grow very well in culture. And um, I'll, in a minute, I'll tell you about the downsides of using these cells compared to, compared to these cells. Okay, so this is kind of a little side, kind of side trip off this. But we, had, we were able to identify that these proteins localize to the kinetochores with antibodies. And we also knew that this complex was elongated, quite elongated, with a predicted, um, with an average structure measured in vitro of 57 nanometers or 55 nanometers. And so what we wanted to know was how is this complex specifically oriented at the kinetochore, right? Is it stuck in with this end, buried in here, with this end out, or vice versa? Is it perpendicular to the structure? How is this oriented to the kinetochore? Because if we knew that, this would give us a better idea of what these different domains might be doing, like which domain is anchoring it in, which domain is maybe interacting with the microtubules. And so what we did was a, another antibody approach using immunofluorescence, and we simply used an antibody to HEC1. And for the secondary antibody, we tagged that with a green floor. And then back here, we used an antibody to SPC24, and our secondary antibody had a red floor on it. And we did immunofluorescence. We fixed the cells, did immunofluorescence, and here's a HeLa cell showing this. And so you can see here all the different little paired dots for kinetochores, um, which look like this in cartoon form. And basically, if we blow up one of these regions of this paired sister kinetochore, of this paired sister kinetochore um, group here, what you can see, hopefully very clearly, is that the green floor is exterior to the red floor, right? And the same, case, and the same is on the sister kinetochore. The green floor is exterior to the red floor suggesting that, the, that this end of the complex is anchored closer into the chromosome, and this end of the complex is sticking out, right? Does that make sense? And so we can actually go on if we can get enough photons and if we can get our, algor our, our centroid identifying algorithms correct, we can go on to actually measure the distance between these two. And so we can do this. I won't go into all the details. I have a couple slides if you're interested. But basically, we measure, measure, measure the centroid of the red, measure the centroid of the green, and we can figure out the distance. And we were able to calculate that, at least in vivo, one end of the complex was about 47 nanometers away from the other end of the complex. And again, this was important biologically to us because it means that this back end, SPC24, is stuck in the chromosome and leaving the HEC1 NUF2 and out to perhaps interact with the microtubules. OK, so now we get to function. So we know that it localizes in the right place at the right time. But if you get rid of it, does it alter mitosis in any way? And so what we do is we do use a very common technique, which is RNA um, interference or RNAi, which is a technique that we can use to deplete any of the proteins of interest 
And again, I won't go into the details, but the basic idea, and I'll focus on HEC1 because that's the protein I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. But basically, we tra transfect into cells these SI or small RNAs, and they correspond to the sequence of our target. What happens, there's a, cas a, a cascade that occurs that results in the degradation of that RNA, which prevents the produ production of the protein. And depending on the turnover rate of your protein in a cell, you can eventually get protein depletion. Okay. So basically, you get rid of the RNA, it can't make protein, and your protein will eventually be depleted. And so we can do this for all these components of the NDC80 complex and now ask what happens to mitosis. So I'm, I'm first just going to show you some, some movies that we generated. These are, uh, this is a control HeLa cell, and this is a HeLa cell that's been depleted by, um, for HEC1. And this is just using um, differential interference contrast light microscopy to look at the kind of the progression through mitosis. And again, well, first I'll let it play, and then I'll tell you why we don't get much information out of this. So again, here's a control cell. It's just entered into mitosis. You can't really see what's happening, but eventually it does divide and appears to make two cells. Okay. So it looks like mitosis may be going okay in that cell. On the other hand, if we look at this cell that's been depleted of HEC1, we can see rather than entering into mitosis, it just kind of sits there and sits there and sits there and doesn't do anything. And the cell will, I think this movie plays for five hours, and um, we, we, we stop filming after five hours, but if we let it go to about eight hours, this cell would then go under apoptosis directly from mitosis and just, and die. So all this tells us is that the control cell goes through mitosis and the HEC1 depleted cell does not go through mitosis. But very clearly, you can't see what's going on inside the cell. And again, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, the cell, that cell type was a HeLa cell. It's a human cervical cancer cell. And the problem with imaging a lot of human cells in the lab is that unfortunately, they remain very flat during interphase, but they round up into spheres during mitosis. So it makes them very hard to image. So they're not very optically amenable. So we, there are some tricks that we can do to see the internal components of the cell. And so basically what we can do is mark, say, the chromosomes or the microtubules or the kinetochores to see what those different structures are doing during mitosis. And in this set of movies, what we've done is we've expressed in these cells a GFP-tagged chromosomal protein, a, a histone protein. So now the chromosomes are fluorescent. And so now we can see a little better about what's happening with the chromosome movement. And so in a control cell, you can see very nicely that the chromosomes align up to a tight metaphase plate and then go right off into anaphase and to form two daughter cells. Whereas in the HEC1 depleted cell, it has a much harder time, and now you can really see the chromosomes. They're making really no progress to aligning at the metaphase plate. They're just kind of jostling around and jostling around. This movie loops, it's a two hour movie that loops, loops around, but again, um, if we let this go for several more hours, the cell would eventually die under these conditions. Okay, so again, I just want to point out um, one of the main reasons that we do use PTK1 cells in the lab is, again, they are very flat in mitosis, and we can see quite a bit of what's happening even without using fluorescent probes. And I'll just show these very quickly. In the control cell, again, you can see very, very clearly the chromosomes line up. You can even see that last la lagging chromosome coming in, and the cell divides. And then we have a disaster here where we've depleted HEC1, and the chromosomes are just all over the place. They don't know where to go. They can't align. And finally, there's this abortive anaphase and cytokinesis. So what this tells us so far is that you absolutely need these proteins, and in particular HEC1, uh, for, chromosome, um, for correct chromosome segregation. But if you remember, our original biological question was, how do we link the kinetochores to the microtubules, kinetochore microtubule attachment? And so to, to, to assay or to test, how, um, how this protein is involved in, in generating these kinetochore microtubule attachments, we've developed a series of assays um, that, try to get at this, that try to get at this question. And so although our lab has, we use quite a few of these, I'm only going to describe three, just to give you an idea of some of the light microscopy assays that we use. So one of the first ones that we use is very, very simple. It's just localization of the microtubule ends in relation to the kinetochore. So basically we just want to ask, does the kinetochore associate with the microtubule end? So again, we take cells, we fix them, we stain for microtubules with antibodies, we stain for the kinetochore with antibodies, and then we image these cells. We take about 100 um, images in a stack, and then we can, we can individually identify each of the kinetochores and ask if it's associated with the microtubule. 
And to help us do that, what we can do is we can decomvolve the images. This isn't the greatest example, but we can decomvolve the images and we can volume render it so that way we can look at all angles and see you know, unambiguously if we identify a kinetochore, we can ask if it is indeed associated with the end of a microtubule. And the advantage of doing volume renderings is versus kind of a maximum projection of just pressing all of your images into one is that you may be seeing a, a kinetochore that has a microtubule that looks like it's bound to its end, but it's really just passing by. But in that one snap view, you can't tell. But if you do the volume rendering, it's much easier to tell. Okay. So a second trick that we can use to assay kinetochore microtubule attachment stability is um, we kind of we utilize this property of microtubules um, and kind of take advantage of that for this assay. So microtubules are very labile polymers and they're extremely sensitive to the cold. So all you have to do is dunk the cells in the cold and all the microtubules will disappear. They'll depolymerize. Except the microtubules that are plugged into a kinetochore. That confers some kind of stability on it, right? So what you can do is you can take your cells, dunk them in, the, in ice cold media, right? Fix the cells, stain for the microtubules, and then simply quantify the microtubule polymer in the control cells versus cells for where you've say depleted HEC1. Right? And so the, the microtubules that are embedded into a kinetochore, they resist that cold depolymerization, and so they hang around. There's lots of microtubules. But the ones that have free ends that aren't attached sim just de depolymerize back. And so again, this is another functional assay that we can use to, to, to gauge whether or not stable kinetochore microtubule attachments have been formed. And the final assay that I'll, that I'll mention is one where we measure interkinetochore tension. So I've, kind of, I've tried to diagram this out here in, in cartoon form. But when both sister kinetochores stably become um, attached to microtubules from both of the opposite poles, what happens is they generate a pulling force that actually stretches the kinetochores away from each other. Okay. When kinetochores are not attached to microtubules, there's no pulling force and they're, set, they're, to be at re they're said to be at rest length. So we can simply measure the interkinetochore distance between the two and get a gauge of whether the attachments are stable and they're attached from both poles or there are no attachments. So again, it's a nice kind of marker of our, whether or not the kinetochore microtubule attachments are stabilized. Okay. Okay. So basically, what I, what I want to say here is we know that if we um, if we carry out all these assays in control cells, we see we see nice attachment of kinetochores to microtubules. We see a high level of microtubule polymer. And we see high, we see nicely stretched kinetochores. But if we do this for our HEC1 depleted cells, again, we see no attachment of microtubules to kinetochores. We see very low microtubule polymer and very low interkinetochore distance. So basically, this tells us pretty clearly that you require this complex to generate stable kinetochore microtubule attachments. But again, this is what I was talking about a little, a little bit before. Just because you knock something out and you lose function, that tells you nothing about what the complex is doing and how it's physically attaching to the microtubules, which is what we really want to know. We know and we, we have a, we're a step forward because we can knock it out and we don't have attachment. But how it attaches is still what we're very interested in understanding. Okay. So I'm going to skip ahead to kind of how we came to this model and just jump right to the model. But if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about it. But we, we generated a model for how this complex may be generating attachments to microtubules at the kinetochore based on the biochemical properties of this protein called HEC1. And again, we know the structure of a portion of this complex. And so we actually know the structure of the globular domain of HEC1 and the globular domain of NUF2. But what's interesting and what's not in the crystal structure is this highly intrinsically disordered, unstructured um, domain that is at the far end terminus of HEC1. So basically, it's a floppy, unstructured tail that sticks off of HEC1. And what's interesting biochemically about it is it's extremely positively charged and very basic. So with that, we came up with a model that said perhaps kinetochore microtubule attachments are, are mediated or generated through the binding of this very, very positively charged floppy tail of HEC1 with the negatively charged surface of the microtubule lattice. So we know that the tubule and subunits that make up microtubules also have these little unstructured tails, which happen to be acidic and very negatively charged. So kind of a very simplistic view a very kind of simple hypothesis to test would be that the interactions are mediated through the positively charged tails of HEC1 and the negatively charged surface of the microtubule lattice by electrostatic interactions. Okay. Okay. So how do we test this? If this is our hypothesis, how do we test this? 
So again, we're going to use um, RNA interference, but basically in this experiment, we're not only going to deplete HEC1, but we're going to transfect back into the cells either wild-type functional HEC1 or mutant versions. Okay? And so the key here is to fuse the expressed proteins that are going in to a fluorescent protein so we can track the expression levels and localization. Okay? So we're going to take out the original and we're going to put back in what we want, deplete the endogenous and replace with our mutants. And again, the key is that the, the mutants or the wild type that we put in are going to have a GFP so we can follow them throughout the cell and see where they go. Okay. And so that's shown here. So remember when I showed you, when you knock out HEC1, it's a mess. Chromosomes are all over the place. You can't align. You can't attach. But if you knock out HEC1 and now put back in the wild type control normal version with just a GFP tag on it, what you can see is this, this now exogenous protein can bind to the kinetochores very nicely. And in fact, it can rescue all those phenotypes. You get a nice metaphase plate. Kinetochore microtubule attachment is restored. So by putting back in the wild type version, you can rescue that phenotype. However, our experiment then was to just lop off that tail that we think is doing all the binding. So we can do that. We can make a mutant where that tail is gone, express this mutant back into cells. This mutant very nicely goes to kinetochores, as you can see with these paired dots. But unlike the wild type, just missing this little 80 amino acid tail it cannot rescue either the alignment phenotype or the kinetochore microtubule attachment phenotype. So that little domain is absolutely required for generating those attachments to microtubules. Okay. Now, okay, so that was, that's exciting. So we think it's this tail that at least is, is, is making these attachments. You have a positively charged tail, negatively charged surface. You get a nice tight binding between the complex and the microtubules. But as I mentioned before, and I showed you those movies, that, that interaction doesn't just need to be tight. It has to be regulatable and fluid so that it can, when it needs to, it can bind loosely so it can go down the microtubule lattice. And in many cases, which I didn't talk about, microtubules actually have to, or kinetochores have to let go of a, of a microtubule altogether if there's an incorrect attachment made. So even though we, we're, we feel very strongly that this tail mediates this strong interaction, we're still left with the idea that we need to figure out how this interaction is regulated. And so the strength of the attachment must be very finely regulated to allow not only for release of incorrect microtubules, but for fluid movement of kinetochores along the depolymerizing and polymerizing lattice. So, so here's what we were thinking. So here's the tail domain, right? And just ignore all the numbers and letters, but this is the tail domain. It's very highly positively charged. But what we have shown just recently, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll get to the punchline in just one second, but what we've shown recently is that this tail domain can be phosphorylated by a very important mitotic kinase. So, that, so what that means, basically, is that this kinase can put on negatively charged phosphate groups all on the tail. Okay, right? So our model is you have positively charged tail binding negatively charged lattice, but we know, and we've shown in vivo now, that there's a kinase that can go decorate this tail with negative charges. So we thought, well, maybe that's how it's being regulated. At some point in the cell, at some point during mitosis, this kinase knows when this attachment needs to be loosened, can phosphorylate the tail and allow for detachment off the microtubule lattice. Okay. So again, that's our model. So we have tight binding. The phosphorylation deposits the negatively charged phosphate groups, and now we have a repulsion and a release. So how are we going to test it? So, let me go ahead one. so again, we're going to use our silence and rescue approach by depleting out the endogenous protein and putting in mutants. But the types of mutants that we're going to put in this time are mutants that are either constitutively negatively charged, which mimics the phosphorylation, right? So we, have, we now have the tail that's going to mimic that phosphorylation all the time. And we have a second mutant that cannot be phosphorylated. Okay, so the two situations are highly negatively charged, or one that's highly positively charged and doesn't even have the chance to get negatively charged. Does that make sense? Right? So it's either constitutively positively charged or constitutively negatively charged. And so, well, for, I think this, this first starts with the phosphomimic, so this is the negatively charged tail. And so what we find, again, if we express, we knock out the endogenous, we express back in wild type, we see nice metaphase plates and nice attachments. However, if we put in our phosphomimic where the whole tail is, is now um, covered with these negative charges, what we find is, as expected, no kinetochore microtubule binding, 
and no chromosome alignment. And if we take it through the ringer of our assays, we see that there's, no, there's decreased microtubule end association, we have very few cold stable microtubules, and the interkinetic distance is very low at rest length. So, so now all we've done, we've put the whole protein back in, we've just changed some of the charges on that tail, and that's enough to completely have a null situation. Okay, so the opposite experiment I think is a little more interesting, where now we have the consistently positively charged tail, so we think it should bind tightly, but it doesn't have the opportunity to get phosphorylated. So it's, when it's bound, it's bound. There's no chance for that kinase to come in and deposit those negatively charged groups. And so what we found was, although the chromosomes don't align, and I'll explain that later, we found that the kinetochore microtubule attachments are very stable and very robust. Again, what we would expect if you have the positively charged tail binding to the negatively charged lattice of the microtubule. So we see very strong, very robust kinetochore microtubule attachments. And I'll go ahead and tell you kind of the punchline, but basically what we see when we look at live cell images is we see once a kinetochore makes an attachment to a microtubule in this situation, it doesn't matter if it's a correct attachment, an incorrect attachment, it's stuck like glue and they just can't let go. So the movies, you end up seeing these chromosomes that get attached and they're just stuck. They can't go anywhere. So, for instance, if you have, so one of the spindle poles is here and one is here, so you're supposed to be attached like this, right? What, what these chromosomes do is sometimes by accident, they get attached to microtubules from the same pole like this. And so you can see them just sitting there, like struggling against that pole because they cannot break those attachments because they can't get phosphorylated to reduce that charge to cause the release. Okay. And again, we take it through, the ex through these experiments. We see high level of microtubule end-on association. We see abundant cold stable polymer and hyper-stretched, very stretched kinetochores. Okay. And so this is getting at what I was saying was that we know that if you, if, you, if you have hyperphosphorylation, you can't bind at all. If you have absolutely no phosphorylation, you bind very, very tightly. But the question we wanted to ask, is there some level of phosphorylation that you require to, to do that fluid movement from kinetochores along microtubules? And the way that we tested this was to actually look in the cells and to measure the kinetochore movements or oscillations in a wild type situation or this phosphomutant that can't be phosphorylated. And so in the wild type situation here, we're just looking at the kinetochores, and the movements that you see are being driven by the attached microtubules that are pushing and pulling by depolymerizing and polymerizing. So again, all you're seeing are the kinetochores, but these guys are all attached to microtubules. And so if you follow a pair, you can see that they're undergoing these excursions between the two poles, kind of back and forth in a coordinated manner. Now, in the, phosphomet in the phosphomutant state, you can see just by eye, even, at the same playback, this is very different. The kinetochores are in the middle of the cell, and they're not doing these kind of, wa we have a little bit of photo bleaching here, it'll come back up, but they're not doing these very exaggerated uh, kinetochore oscillations, but they're, for the most part, kind of stagnating here in the center of the cell. But again, here's one of these scintillic, or one of these uh, kinetochore pairs that's attached to both microtubules from the same pole, and you can see it just, it's, just sits there and it can't, it, can't, it can't let go. And so we can actually quantify this behavior rather than just looking at it by tracking the movement of these, uh, of these kinetochores. And so when we track the movement of the kinetochores over time, here we've plotted distance over time here. And so the red bars, this, this indicates a sister kinetochore pair. This indicates a sister kinetochore pair. And again, this is distance in microns. So you can imagine kind of one pole would be up here and one pole is down here and you can see the, the kinetochores oscillating back and forth between the two poles, just like the motion that you saw in the cell. Whereas in the phosphomutant, where, it, where it's stuck very tightly, we see something very different, where we see there, there's some chatter, but we see, for the most part, very dampened movements. And again, from these measurements that we make, we can, we can extract some data, so we can measure the velocity of movement, which significantly decreases from the wild type to the, to the phosphomutant situation. We can measure the time paused, which is, I think, um, nine seconds in a row without, without moving in either direction. And that significantly increases in the phosphomutant situation. And we can also measure the excursion distance. The reason we call it this, we're trying to measure the amplitude, the oscillation amplitude, but it becomes tricky when you cannot d exactly define your switch points. So we actually had a really, I mean, we worked for a long time 
to try to find switch points. That was just a big push in the lab. We even went to, um, um, Keith actually went to the statistics department or the business department to talk to people who track the stock market to try to figure out, because it's very important that they know exactly when those switches happen of up and down. And so trying to get their algorithms to figure out what those switch points exactly are. And it's very difficult to define those switch points, especially in an ambiguous situation like this. So we're still working on that. But in, in the meantime, we've kind of used a, a substitute measurement called excursion distance. And basically what we do is we, we look at the average, uh, let's see, the average um, position of these two kinetochores. And then we measure the deviation from that average position. And that's kind of our our excursion distance. But the bottom line is that these, the, without, without having phosphorylation on this tail domain, um, they're stuck. Okay. So this, I mean, this led to the idea then that when you have these attachments, they can't be phosphorylated. You know, by doing these measurements and looking at these movies, it suggests that we've now hyperstabilized those attachments. But we don't, but we can't say that for sure. So in order to measure that with DFINITY, what we did was we carried out experiments using photoactivatable tubulin to measure the turnover rate of those kinetochore microtubules in this situation. And so I'll just go through it very briefly here. So the hypothesis, again, is the prevention of phosphorylation prevents those microtubule plus ends from exhibiting dynamic behavior. They're locking those ends down. And so we would, we would predict they're hyperstabilized. And so the experiment then is to measure the turnover rate of the microtubule ends in living cells. And of course, our prediction would be the turnover rate is high in control cells and then low in cells where the HEC1 cannot be phosphorylated. And so the way that we do this is that we use cells expressing photoactivatable tubulin. And you guys have probably heard about this maybe in this lecture series. But basically, the microtubules contain tubulin fused to GFP. It's, it's photoactivatable GFP. And the, G, and the photoactivatable GFP only becomes fluorescent after a pre-activation exposure to light. So just to show, just as a, as a demonstration here, we, there's actually a cell sitting here expressing PAGFP. If we excite with 488 nanometer light, you don't see anything. But if we first give it a flash of 405, then now we excite with 488, we see the spindle. Okay. So the experiment then is to focus a laser into a bar-shaped region right onto the mitotic spindle and activate the GFP fluorescence in this little region only and then measure the fluorescence dissipation over time. Does that make sense, right? So we activate that region, it becomes fluorescent. We measure the fluorescence dissipation over time to get a half-life of those microtubules embedded in that kinetochore. Right. Okay, so what I've done here is kind of draw a schematic of what we're going to see in the movie because it's, it's not as, as obviously as clean and straightforward as this, but it'll give you an idea of what's happening in the movie. So again, we're going to focus the laser. So we activate a bar of fluorescence only in this one little region here. And so it's going to activate the tubulin subunits within that region. And then over time, the tubulin subunits are going to, the, the fluorescence in those subunits are going to dissipate. But what makes this complicated is that there's another biological process happening here, which is called flux. And the tubulin subunits are actually going to flux down the fiber, but just try to ignore that and focus on the dissipation of the fluorescence. OK, so that movie is shown here. And again, we're going to flash it. We're going to flash. The, I think the laser is going to go right here. And so it's going to activate the tubulin just in this small little area. So you saw a big flash. So here are the activated regions, and you can see over time, not only do they flux towards the pole, but the fluorescence dissipates out of that spot. So what we can then do is we can measure this, and we can fit these data to a double exponential curve. And the reason we have to do that is because there are multiple populations of tubulin that we've activated in that bar. And so we can differentiate from those populations by using a double exponential curve. But the bottom line, in wild-type cells, we find that the kinetochore microtubule half-life is about eight minutes by doing these experiments. And then finally, I think this is the final experiment of the talk. We now, the, um, the big thing to do is to now do these measurements in the, in the cells that are expressing the phosphomutants. So HEC1 cannot be phosphorylated. We predict hypertype binding. And so hopefully you can see there's going to be a laser there. And so this, uh, this bundle of fibers has been activated. And you can see that it not only does the fluorescence remain high throughout the end of the movie, but it also doesn't flux down the fiber, which is a whole different thing. But from these data, again, we can calculate the dissipation, fit it to a double exponential curve, and we can calculate that now the, half, the half-life of these kinetochore microtubules is now 38 minutes. So finally, we can show that if you don't phosphorylate that little tail domain, you do, in fact, hyperstabilize the kinetochore microtubule attachment.
And this is just kind of a summary of what we talked about. The kinetical microtubule attachment is mediated to the NBC80 complex. And importantly, the tail domain of the protein, of the HEC1 protein, regulates the binding strength so that to, to allow not only release of microtubules, but to allow fluid movement along polymerizing and depolymerizing ends. Okay, so now, in, given this kind of class format, I wanted to summarize some of the assays that we use um, um, and kind of that I've used as an example, our biological process um, was an example of. So first of all, hopefully I showed you that we can localize proteins in the cell using light microscopy. Um, I would say not very precisely, but we can at least localize them in a general area. We can follow the dynamic behavior of certain protein populations using fluorescent protein probes and live cell time-lapse imaging. Using quantitative laser-based assays, such as photoactivating, like I showed you, and photobleaching, we can measure the turnover rates of proteins of interest. And what I didn't talk about today, um, we can actually measure protein-protein interactions to some degree within the cell by using, by using techniques such as FRET, which is fluorescence resonance energy transfer, and BIF-C, which is bimolecular fluorescence complementation. And this is basically where, where you take a half of a GFP and you stick it on one protein, you take the other half of GFP and stick it on the other protein, if those two proteins interact in the cell, the two halves of GFP will come together and fluoresce. So it's a way of, of determining whether or not you have two proteins in your cell that can find each other and interact. And then finally, we discussed quite a few of um, the assays that we use to measure biological functions. So I'll end with just a couple of slides discussing the disadvantages and limitations that we, at least in our lab, feel um, in using these light micro microscopy assays. And the first one is that the functional assays are usually confounded by the complexity of the cell. And again, I discussed this a little bit before, but the idea is that if you knock out a protein and you cause an effect to a process, that doesn't mean that you haven't knocked out a protein, which is then initiated some cascade of other protein function, and it's now the protein at the end of the cascade that's doing your job. Right? So protein A may bind to protein B, protein C, protein D, protein E. And it's actually protein E that's doing your job, but you've knocked out protein A. Right? And so these are problems that we deal with all the time. How do you show that if you affect the function of something, you're really directly affecting the process that you're studying? So that's a problem. So the way we get around that, or the way we try to kind of at least address that, is that we very routinely incorporate biochemical assays using purified reconstituted components. And we try to ask some similar questions in vitro that we ask in vivo and see if they correlate. So for example, you know, we, we have these predictions that our NDC80 complex binds microtubules very tightly. But we also have the prediction that we can change that affinity by changing the charge in the phosphorylation state. So we can simply, in vitro, we can purify mutants that have these charge changes on the tail domain, and we can purify tubulin, mix them together, and then measure various um, binding parameters, kinetic properties of this interaction between these between NDC80 complexes and microtubules, and importantly, the mutants in microtubules. So again, if we can corrob corroborate what we see in vitro, in vivo, with in vitro, then that's a good step towards. Oh, so this is also showing um, some in vitro assays that we do. Um, these are actually done in collaboration with Dick McIntosh here at, in, in Boulder, and then also Katja Grishuk, who's a former postdoc of Dick's, who's now at Penn. And what they've been doing with some of our proteins is actually measuring um, single molecule NDC80 complexes along microtubules and measuring their ability, ability to diffuse. So from experiments like this, where we have microtubules that you can't see, um, we have NDC80 complexes that you can see in GFP, and here we have, this is a chymograph with time on this axis and distance on this axis, we can actually see that some NDC80 complexes just sit there on microtubules, some actually move along microtubules, and from these types of data we can calculate lots of um, very helpful um, information such as the diffusion rate, the residency time, and the k-on and the k-off rates. And again, if we can plug our, mu our mutants into s these, these assays, we can learn a lot about how this complex is binding microtubules. And then finally, probably the biggest hurdle that we have right now is that resolution obtained with traditional high-resolution light microscopy is too low for imaging at the molecular level in cells. So like I said, we can localize proteins and we can see a blob, but that doesn't tell us a lot about the structure of what's happening at that, at that, at that complex. And so um, to combat that, there, it's a, a fun time for this, for this field, I think, and there are many techniques that have been recently developed and are cur currently under development to achieve super-resolution and to break this, um, this resolution barrier 
and I'm not going to go into all these different techniques, except I'm sure you've heard maybe quite a bit about Palm um, from the director. But what we'd like to get from this is we'd eventually one day, um, using these super resolution light microscopy techniques, be able to have, a, have a, a different view of the kinetic core microtubule attachment than we currently do. Like I said, we see, ball, we see sticks and balls, and it would be great if one day we could see exactly how these complexes assemble around the end of the microtubule so we can actually understand what the mechanism is for coupling this polymerization and depolymerization to force generation, and we just can't do that quite yet. And I've just put up here some examples um, of some, these are microtubules um, imaged using traditional high resolution light microscopy and then by um, storm or palm um, super resolution microscopy. And here's an example of a microtubule mixed with clathrin coated pits, I think. And this is the super resolution image. And so again, it'd be great if we could fill in this square to see how these microtubules actually interact with the kinetic cores. And we've been starting a collaboration with Dr. Rafael Piastun here at Boulder to try to reach this goal. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab. Um, these experiments were mainly done by Jeff, Keith, and Lindsay. And um, I'd also like to thank our sources of funding and for inviting me to talk. Okay. You mentioned earlier that um, in your mutant or your damaged cell that sometimes micro a microtubule, two microtubules from the same pole yes. stick to the sister chromatids, the kinetic cords of the sister chromatids. If your mechanism is dynamically varying charge, what's to prevent the that happening in a, in a normal wild type cell that both uh, yes, and the answer is the that does happen all the time in normal cells. But why aren't you get those scintillic attachments. Is that what you're asking? Why don't you get those attachments? Well, so what happens in a normal cell is, and I didn't go into this, but before they become beautifully yeah. attached, it's a mess. You have kinetic cores with my, attached to right. from both poles. You've got a kinetic core attached to a microtubule from this pole and this pole. Mm -hmm. It's called meritillic. And so what ha what's ha has to happen is there's a signaling pathway that induces phosphorylation on that tail, that's what we think, to release that microtubule altogether. But what is the checkpoint that tells mm -hmm. the kinetic core that it's linked to the wrong poles? Okay, so the checkpoint that, so in this situation where you have both, this one. Let's say you have the same pole linked to the, both kinetic cores of the same pole, yes. Okay, so that's scintillic. So the, the checkpoint for that is that the sister kinetic cores are now very close together. They're not under that tension. And so it's thought that the, the actual checkpoint mechanism, so cells going through mitosis do have a very robust checkpoint. If all the kinetic cores are not attached and under tension, the checkpoint will halt cell cycle progression and allow those errors to be corrected. So it's thought that one of the signals for checkpoint is actually tension. And so if, you're, if you have both sisters attached to the same pole, those aren't under tension. They're very close to each other. And so it doesn't signal the tension checkpoint. But what's, the other thing that's cool is that that kinase that phosphorylates the tail to release is, resides in the inner centromere, not at the out. Ah, so if you're, if you're not under tension and if you're really close together, the kinase population can actually very easily phosphorylate the kinetochores. But once you get stretched out, the kinase is far away from the substrate, and so it can't phosphorylate, so you get stable attachments. At least that's the, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And so we, you know, we've addressed this and thought about this a lot. And so uh, what we think is that when we express HEC1 in the cell, or if we just look at the population of HEC1 in the cell, it's exclusively localized at the kinetochore and not in the cytosol. So the idea is that the 
the complex itself is anchored into the kinetochore, so it only has access to the microtubules that are in proximity to the kinetochore. And we can show this, that this is the case, and we did an experiment where we actually lopped off the kinetochore targeting domain, so it was free to float around the cytoplasm, and once it was free to float around the cytoplasm, it, it bound all the microtubules along the lattice, just like you would predict, right, because of electrostatic interactions. Yep. But we think it doesn't do that because it's tethered into the kinetochore. And it actually gets tethered, so kind of an, an intricacy of the, of the cycle is that the nuclear envelope keeps all the chromosomes away from the cytoplasm until right at the last minute, right? And the microtubules are in the cytoplasm. So the, the nuclear envelope keeps the chromosomes from interacting with the microtubules until just at the last moment when the nuclear envelope breaks down. And the kinetochore is actually built prior to nuclear envelope breakdown just so what you mentioned doesn't happen, right? So you, you import all your components into the nucleus, you build your kinetochore, now you can release them into the cytoplasm and the microtubules combined. Because if, if you did it the other way, you'd predict that you'd have these complexes all over the lattice. Right. So for the most part, for, for the antibody dyes, the cells are already fixed and stained and dead. So they're fine. And they are cell permeable. Well, we actually permeabilize the cells before we do the experiment, and then they're cell permeable. So the, 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 the dyes conjugate to the antibodies, and those cells are already dead. But for the live cell experiments, for the most part, we use fluorescent proteins, which are non-toxic to cells. And so when we encode the protein, um, on a plasmid that we now insert into the cell, that plasmid is going to encode the, the formation of the protein we want. And all we've done is we've added the sequence for that green fluorescent protein to the back end of our protein. So when the cell, so when the cell machinery decides to make that protein, it makes your protein of interest, and then it keeps reading into the green fluorescent protein and just tags that onto the end of it. And so now, thanks to um, people like Roger Chen and others, we have a whole color toolbox. Of, we have plum and cherry and tangerine and citron and every color that we can use. The other option is you can inject dyes right into cells, and we do that a lot too. And you have to be careful that you use a dye that's not toxic. Yes, and so the, the way that we maintain confirmation is we put it in a fixative. That, and so the idea is that the fixative you know, fixes everything where it is. And it, of course there are artifacts from fixation that do occur, but the idea is that you're fixing it in a way that maintains the original. I mean, and it's a tricky, I mean, it, that whole, you could have a whole talk just on that about fixation because, you know, what do you put into your fixation mix? If you have proteins that are phosphorylated, you have to make, you have to put in phosphatase inhibitors. You have to, you really have to think about all the different things that could be happening to your proteins and try to mimic the in vivo alive state. So it's, it is, I mean, it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Okay.